So, Timothy, um, you've written this book on the um, freedom of speech. Yeah. And um, so there would be a couple of things we are interested in because it's really the big thing, uh, especially with coming like way. So what could be the ways? What are your concerns? Where are the limits? In particular, if you're speaking about the, I'm, I'm currently speaking, there are a lot of discussions about the free speech. We can go about like religion, hate speech, but speaking about the, um, these events like the Russian threat, trolls, bot, internet, what do you see could be the practice on, um, banning regulation of a particular a harmful content. So first of all, the internet is a fantastic opportunity for free speech and a fantastic danger for free speech. Like every technology, it's two-sided. If you have a knife, you can use a knife to cut your bread or you can use a knife to murder somebody. So the fact that we're able to speak here because you simply have an iPhone and a tripod and then it goes online. That's a fantastic opportunity for free speech. But at the same time, uh, it's the biggest surveillance apparatus in history. It makes the Stasi look like amateurs. Uh, it brings massive dangers of misinformation, disinformation, circulation of hate speech, and so on. We clearly have to combat Russian disinformation, which we now know majorly influenced the US 2016 election, the Brexit referendum, let alone what's happening in Eastern Europe and Ukraine. I think the platforms themselves have to do a lot more because they're the ones who actually know what's really going on on their platforms, identifying the fake accounts, combating the bots and so on. I think governments have to defend the basic integrity of their elections, of their democratic process, but you have to watch out because in Ukraine, in the former Soviet Union in Eastern Europe, you know how dangerous it is if you allow the government to decide what can be said and what can't be said, what's right and what's wrong, what's true and what's false. Then you're back to Big Brother. So I think you have to be very, very careful, and we were just talking about this, in giving government the power to decide what should or should not be said online. So I want the platforms to do much more, I want us to get much smarter, and then I want the government to do the minimum required to protect the basic integrity of the democratic process. Is there anything, uh, and how would you describe any way when the speech could be criminalized? And where is the difference? Because we, when we see, like, there are people speaking about hate speech, there are speaking, you have also the notion of the harmful speech and different shade. We now having this a bit mess around that when we speak in the public debates in Ukraine. So a lot of people just saying that it's not just the, an opinion, it's a harmful speech. So how would you define that? So, so um, first of all, the basic principle is that speech should be absolutely free unless it does harm to other people. That's the first principle. Now, within that, if you take hate speech, there are some people who say we should try and ban by law all sorts of hate speech. And West European countries have laws about that. Just because it's offensive, creates a bad atmosphere between people, reduces their dignity and so on. I think, for the reasons I've just given, that we should only ban by law what I call dangerous speech. And that's a much narrower category. That is speech that is intended and likely to create violence. Uh, this is a direct incitement of violence or pushing towards genocide, for example, like you had in Rwanda, like you had in former Yugoslavia. So I think it's quite a narrow category of speech that we need to go after with the law. More general hate speech, it's up to us. It's up to civil society. It's up to journalists and scholars and writers and filmmakers and ordinary people to fight the battle, to have what I call robust civility, to have a civilized debate. That's very difficult in a situation like Ukraine after the seizure of Crimea and given what's happening in eastern Ukraine. But that's what you have to try to do. And what do you consider just... Well, actually, there are two different debates. The first debate is, should we go after 
all of hate speech just because it's offensive, it's hurtful to people, it's diminishing their dignity. There are many people who argue that we should go after the whole of hate speech. So the first step is to say, no, with the law, the state should only go after dangerous speech. Then the question is, how do you design dangerous speech? And the answer is, it's very contextual. So you know very well in Ukraine, if you have a heavy propaganda against a minority, Russian, Ukrainian, Polish, you name it, Jewish, Muslim, in a free society where you have pluralistic media, uh, where you have the rule of law, where you have a strong civil society, a country like Britain or Ireland, for example, that's one thing. The same speech which is not dangerous there is very dangerous when you're at war in a situation like Ukraine or former Yugoslavia. So it depends very much on the context. But my general worry, having talked to you a bit about what is happening in Ukraine, is probably the government is doing too much to try and draw those lines which are not clear line and saying this Russian material can't be allowed, that Russian material can't be allowed rather than focusing on the stuff which is really dangerous. And by the way, history, contested history like that between Russia and Ukraine, in my view, should be not a matter for parliaments and governments. We should not try to legislate the historical truth about Crimea or Vawinia or whatever it may be. It should be a matter of free argument between historians, journalists, filmmakers, citizens. Would you elaborate more on this concept of the dangerous speech, which would be like the imminent, that it means that somebody would be able to commit a crime, and like a difference, you know? So in this context, I think that was also in your book. Yes, so this is really, really important. So the classic test in the American free speech tradition, and we're speaking in America, greatest free speech tradition in the world, is what's called the Brandenburg test. Brandenburg was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. And the test is that the violence has to be intended, likely, and imminent. In other words, I go out there and I say, we need to kill Natalia. And it's plausible to think, I really mean it, and there are enough armed people around here, we'll actually go and kill Natalia. That's the classic text. The trouble is, in the world of what I call the post-Gutenberg world, the world of the internet, where everybody is becoming neighbors with everything else, what is imminent online when everything online is imminent? That's to say, it may have been posted 20 years ago in Croatia, but could it can still be dangerous today because it's still up there and it's like someone saying it today. So my argument is we have to go further up the food chain of violence, right? So if you have massive, massive, constant propaganda and agitation about, say, the situation in eastern Ukraine or this minority or that minority, that may become dangerous speech in, in a context where you have lots of armed men around and people ready to do violence. Um, but, but the criteria should always remain the danger of violence. And what always the, not just far right, but um, a lot of people, especially the populists today, here in the US as well, but also in Ukraine, what they're accusing liberals, especially with the notion of the political correctness, that this there is a hypocrisy, there are double standard. So, you know, like, we are not allowed to say these kind of things about a particular group of people, uh, but, uh, so for instance, the, the, the there are some kind of privilege group who can say anything they want, and like we, conservative or populist, are not allowed to do things which somebody would consider racist, misogynist, or the others. So this answer to hypocrisy, which is also we, we can have here, you know, because I think a lot of people really like Trump because they said, you know, he's speaking as people think. They for a while didn't let us speak what we think about, I don't know, the black, the Muslims, and the others. And uh, this is probably a global phenomenon. How you really answer this question on this double standard? I think it's a real problem. There has been an attitude in privileged places in the West, places like Stanford and Oxford, 
that liberalism means only listening to liberal views. And that's not liberalism, that's the opposite of liberalism. Liberalism means listening to the widest possible range of views, including those you hate and abhor and are really offensive. And, for example, speakers from the right, but serious people from the right, being banned from university campuses because their views are not acceptable. And that's, number one, fundamentally illiberal. I call it illiberal liberalism, right? Number two, it has bad consequences because one reason we have Trump and Marine Le Pen and Brexit and the Alternative für Deutschland and all these nationalist populist movements is a large part of our societies felt, number one, their voice wasn't heard. They simply were ignored by liberal elites, mainstream media. Number two, if they were heard, they were denounced as racists and sexists and uh, the basket of deplorables, as Hillary Clinton put it. So that um, I think we really have to watch out. Of course, that doesn't mean we just let those intolerable, racist, sexist views, uh, just let them go. But you have to listen to what people are saying and then contest them, argue back, counter speech, but not trying to close the window of what is allowable. It's a very unhealthy situation where a large part of your society thinks, I can't say what I think. And then along comes Donald Trump or Marine Le Pen or whoever it may be. And all these people say, at last someone is saying it, is telling it how it is. But, you know, the dilemma for the media in Ukraine, for instance, I've given you two cases and just would like ask you command. We have, for instance, an attack on LGBT pride. And what the media usually do, they would call the leader of the LGBT. But do you mean a physical attack? Physical attack, a physical, a physical attack. attack. So they have, for instance, the, the really you have the neo-Nazi group or far-right group, which is kind of attacking the uh, maybe attacking violently but also like harassing and threatening the LGBT pride speaking very so the dilemma is like do you put them in the TV show together and giving the second example for instance you have an attack on the Roma camp so what usually the media do in our place they pick up the guy who is the most prominent leader of some kind of far-right group and the let's say the Roma human rights activists so they clash and it's kind of a balance, but there is something in that. That's that a for, it's a false balance. I mean, look. Yeah, so that's what I would like to explain. So, so this is really interesting. So I have a whole chapter in the book about journalism and what journalists needs, need to do. And, and that is a, a, a simplistic false balance. I mean, the first point is, say once again, the key line is violence, violence, violence. So one of my key principles is we neither make threats of violence nor accept violent intimidation. So if it's actually violence against gay rights and LGBT community, right, we have to do everything we can to stop those guys and not necessarily giving them a platform, right? So you have to explain journalistically the whole context. You have to put that out there, that one side is using violence and the other is not. So they're not equal, they're not the same. But should you give airtime for socially conservative, maybe Christian conservative views about LGBT issues to air that other side? Yes, absolutely. Not to the men of violence, not to the fascists, but to the socially conservative views. Yeah, that, that is today the biggest difference. So, so it's not symmetry. It's not symmetry between the, the murderer and the victim. Right? You, know, you don't do that. That's, you don't do that. And that's, that's a, a mistake, by the way, even the BBC has made by putting people on the same level. Um, but, but, but what you shouldn't do is make the mistake which much of the German media made for many, many years, which is um, to be so sort of fearful of addressing these issues and these views these conservative or right-wing or reactionary views, that you don't address them at all. You just try and ignore and stay in your liberal bubble. And then what happens is those views are bubbling away 
in the kitchens and at home and in the pubs and so on. And there are right-wing media, media online who will pick them up like Breitbart did in this country. And then they explode with more violence. So, you know, the, the, the American saying, sunlight is the best disinfectant. You've got to get those views up there, get them into the sunlight and disinfect them. Um, still kind of staying on Ukraine because it has a lot of these right. precedents, very interesting because it's happening now. So for instance we have interesting case when there was one TV channel, we know the, the person is really had the money from, might have money from the former regime, it may have Russian money, but it has money and it can operate yeah, with the terms of their kind of freedom of speech. And the thing they are doing is the for instance, they may speak that Alexian Sov might be a terrorist. So, and with the experience we used to have, you know, creating this ground of the attack on Crimea, the war in Donbas, you know, this really, um, and, and using the this kind of media in Ukraine uh, with dubious funding, we have the case when, you know, there are other people, the politicians and even the people in civil society said, like, those people should go behind the bars, it's a treason which for me is a bit shocking in a way because there is a difference we disagree with them but that is an issue that so when we really knew the cases when the propaganda was used as a weapon in our own cases and you know the people who were speaking of those kind of things indeed later run this kind of separatist republic or like get engaged uh, so they're usually now accused not of really breaching the freedom of speech or saying something but is a treason, or kind of cooperating with the separatists, which also is a treason, you know. So, really, where do you think is that? And that is usually the security service answer that you know, like, but these guys are dangerous. We had seen that within a couple of years, a couple, a couple of years ago, that they were there. So, what do you think that could it be this principle of still that idea? Doesn't matter what, unless they just saying. You can't really criminalize that. So you know the American phrase, freedom for the thought we hate. So the fact that the thought is hateful in itself doesn't mean you should shut it up. Um, but I think your context in Ukraine is so special because you are effectively in war or semi-war. Let's, let's call it a state of war. And so you have imminent violence, you have violence going on, and, you know, there, there have always been accepted some limits to free speech on the grounds of national security. So the question is where you draw the lines. And it's a judgment call about where you draw the line. And it's a very difficult judgment call because info war is part of the spectrum of high hybrid warfare, as you know better than anybody. And the way these things are played now it's not Nazi radio with the swastika. It's somebody's put money and somebody else is pulling the strings and it's all totally unclear who exactly is behind it. So I, I think it's a very, very difficult question. All I would say is um, do as you would be done by. That is to say, when you're drawing those lines, think where you would want the lines drawn for making the Ukrainian case in Moscow, right? And think whether you're not going too far in terms of banning uh, views that are simply offensive and hateful, particularly in this context, rather than actually being part of a consolidated campaign for violence and against the basic security integrity of the state. Now, that's a rather general answer, but, uh, but I think, you know, it is just a balancing act. But, like, if to be creative, uh, that would be maybe my, uh, my question to think about, uh, because it hasn't been solved properly yet. Who could be the stakeholders, the bodies involved in taking this decision? So, really, if you really would like to make this law or any kind of decision... Great. So, first of, first of all, you have to have clear principles. You have to be clear, and my impression is that in Ukraine the lines are anything but clear. And secondly, if at all possible, you want to have it at one remove from the state. Because if it's directly the government, 
then there'll be politics in it. There's no way around that. And it's always dangerous to have the government rather than independent courts or independent regulators. So having a really strong independent regulator, like, for example, Ofcom in Britain, is a genuinely independent regulator of broadcasting, is always going to be better. So uh, and uh, may I say one other thing, which is, the other thing is, so you have this absolutely hateful speech out there. What do you do about it in any given situation? And, and a lot of people say, shut them up. Some people say, lock them up. But another answer is, build up the other side of the argument. Build up the liberal, the open, the pro-European uh, side of the, of the media and of the argument, rather than putting all the focus on closing those guys down. Yeah, therefore, uh, th that's what I would say, that, okay, you can't be in this extreme position that, like, government should never ban anything at all, because that yeah. it's way, it, it, it's so, so, no so, solution with that. So, 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 violence, violence, violence. I mean, if there's one thing I want people to take away from this interview is if you, the criteria is, is it contributing to the likelihood of violence? Draw that line there. Is it dangerous speech? When you're invoking national security, there's always a tendency for governments to try and shut people up on grounds of national security when what they actually mean is their own political security, their position in power. It's something uncomfortable they don't want to come out. So there are legitimate restrictions on grounds of national security, but watch out. One debate which is still new to Ukraine, it's debate about the freedom of religion and the tolerance. So really, would you maybe explain what are the main idea of your chapter of your book, in particular how you accept others' religion? And we're coming about, you know, the freedom to, um, which I, as I remember, is formalized that I respect your right to believe, but it doesn't mean... So, so the principle, and, and this is a huge issue all over the world, free speech and religion, I mean, in many countries in the world, it's actually what leads to the most controversy. You know, one thinks of the Mohammed cartoons, for example. Our principle is we respect the believer, but not necessarily the content of the belief. I'll say that again. We respect the believer, but not necessarily the content of the belief. That's to say, I have an unconditional respect for you, whether you're Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, practicing Jew, Muslim, Scientologist, whatever it is your belief is, your right to believe, your dignity as a believer, unconditional respect. But I must have the freedom to criticize the content of the belief. Because if we make that a taboo, think of a, country, a city like London, which has people from every country and every religion in the world, every belief system in the world. If you put together all the taboos of all the religions in the world, there's precious little you can still talk about. So that's the balancing act. Unconditional respect for the believer, the right to criticize in civil terms, not to abuse, but to criticize the content of the belief. But that's the, then, would the believers accept that? Because okay, so that's a great question, and many wouldn't. Many would say, this is nonsense. That distinction makes no sense. Respect me, respect my belief. But if we want to have a free society in which people with different religions and none coexist, we have to work towards that distinction, that balancing act. And after all, there are many societies in Western Europe, for example, also in the United States. You know, you're living in one of the most multi-religious societies in the world. Here, we're sitting in one of the most multi-religious societies in the world. Amazing variety of religions. And it works. Everybody respects each other's right to have their own beliefs, but they don't necessarily respect the belief itself. And do you also make a distinction between the offense and like how subjective offense, how people feel that they're offended by some of the speech and the offense of the dignity? So what's that? 
Meaning that like some people are offended by some of the free speech, so you shouldn't offend. But as I understood that you can say offensive things. The point that you shouldn't, meaning like that you can't not avoid that people could be so, offended. So, so, so the principle has to be no one has a right not to be offended. There's no right not to be offended. And mere offence, finding something offensive, cannot be in a free society the grounds for closing down speech. You will know that in 17th century Poland, in the, in the noble democracy, the Schlachta, they had the thing called the Liberum Veto, where just one Polish nobleman could get up and veto any proposition. And what we're getting in, in many countries now is a sort of Liberum Veto, when just one person has to stand up and say, I'm offended as a woman, as a Jew, as a Muslim, as a Christian, whatever it may be, as an atheist, and speech is closed down. And that's a road to unfreedom. That would be a disastrous way to go. There has to be some genuine harm, harm, not just offence. And uh, we started with a new development on the online, but being here in Silicon Valley, yes. you know, what do you really see, what are the major concerns, and what could be, you know, practical things on this part, you know, like, in the in their nearest future, which we can expect from big high tech and from the cooperation of the government, uh, because it's also an issue of the sovereignty, because being in this institution, it felt that they are international, but they feel they, they say they're international, but they feel they, they have the U.S., they have the U.S. law, and they don't taking much care about how the things are things. So, I mean, I call them the private superpowers. They are a new kind of superpower. Facebook is the largest country on Earth, more than two billion regular monthly users. And at the moment, they're making, so to speak, their own laws. Uh, which are non-transparent, non-appealable, non-accountable. So we have to keep pushing them. Actually, the European Union is doing very good work in this respect, really important work in respect of privacy and respect of competition. But for, for you and me, thinking about political news and political information, I think there are some things that we want Facebook to do and Google to do. I think we actually want them to make sure that there are places you can go on Facebook or on Google where you know that what is called news is actually news. It comes from quality sources. It's not the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg. It's not a bunch of kids in Macedonia manufacturing clickbait. It's actually serious journalism. And when you go to that place, call it Google News, call it Facebook News, you'll actually have good journalistic sources and a wide range of views. That's one thing they can do. Another thing they could do is to give us more choice of what we can see. Because at the moment, what every one of your viewers sees on their Facebook news feed is decided by a single algorithm, which is written and developed and tweaked over here. And we don't know what it is, and we don't control it. So I think them recognizing that they have a kind of public interest duty all over the world to supply us something that looks more or less like reliable news and to give us more choice and more control. I think that's pretty important. And um, you've given an example also of Germany handling the issue of banning some of the videos, which could be exemplary. So it's not clear ban. What would you see that, for instance, they are just warning, you still can get access, but you get a warning that this contact is harmful. So how do you see these particular things? You know, how it could, yeah, how you could be developed. So for instance, you know, like some governments just shut up. You can't get there to, to an article or something. They build a firewall or something. But what I understand in some particular cases that you won't have the first click. So this is my one click away principle, which comes out of the incredibly uh, heated debate after the murder of the Charlie Hebdo journalists in Paris for drawing those cartoons of Mohammed. And the question was, 
Should we, the Western media, a paper like The Guardian or Le Monde, republish the cartoons as a gesture of solidarity with the people? Now, I was in favour of that, but I didn't get very far because an awful lot of people in newspaper editors said no. We don't do that. It'll be offensive to many of our readers. And what I came up with was what I call the one-click-away principle, which is if it's really offensive, difficult material, put it up online and tell your readers where it is. And then you have the choice. If you're a devout Muslim and you don't want to see images of Muhammad, you don't have to go there. Nobody has to go there. That's the beauty of online but it's totally accessible to anyone who wants to see it. And, you know, Timothy, my, my final would be simple and not just. Um, here's general display. Explain, in the, like, for, for somebody, why the free speech matters. Why in times of war, insecurity and everything, in, because a lot of people would say the value of free speech is sometimes overdone, you know, it's very somewhere it's very abstract so sometimes it's our task to explain to the society why it's not about the freedom of me meaning like a journalist so free speech is the freedom on which all other freedoms depend it's the oxygen of all other freedoms um, for a start we cannot express ourselves we cannot be ourselves we cannot know who the other person is unless you can explain to me who you are, where you're coming from, what matters to you, and I can explain that to you. We cannot begin to control our government. We cannot begin to control our government unless we have the freedom of speech and the freedom of information. So we know what they're up to, uh, we can check it, we can make them accountable. Um, also, if you're talking about ser ser searching for the truth, whether in academic inquiry or in journalism, how can you do that unless you have free speech? So I have a, a simple acronym, which in English is STGD, Self, Truth, Government, Diversity. We need it to be ourselves, to express ourselves. We need it to seek the truth. We need it for good government, and we need it to live with diversity. It is the freedom on which all other freedoms exist. You cannot point me to any free or just society which does not have free speech. If free speech goes today, freedom will go tomorrow. Thank you.